Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com tells us the major equity markets did well until midweek when the so-called fangs took it on the chin. Joseph Schachter from the Schachter Energy Report gives us a lowdown on how the coronavirus is hitting the oil and gas markets. He also comments on how blockades and politics in general are hitting the Canadian energy sector. Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite, gives us some tips on how to deal with a market downturn and also peaks at the green energy sector. Ed Steer from edsteergoldandsilver.com gives us some insight into the surge in precious metals. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from American Manganese President Larry Ray. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can also find Ross on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Always a pleasure, Jim. Ross, the equity market set new highs midweek, but towards the end of the week, uh, things went a little off the rails by yeah, a bit? Yeah, I got a little bit of a scare. What was it, uh, Wednesday or Thursday morning? The market sold off hard and bounced back. And then Friday, you know, you've got more talk about uh, coronaviruses in uh, in uh, South Korea, and you know, just um, now the the extension of on the ideas about how long it might take before this has run its course. You know, everybody's starting to come up with new numbers, but nobody has any idea when uh, when this thing will uh, be under control. So markets are jittery, and uh, you know they're volatile, which is what happens when you've been running as hard as they have this year. Uh, you know, you, you take a look at the breakdown of it. I think forty percent of the S and P run. Uh, has been with uh, just the top 10 stocks in in the index by capitalization. Um, then you take a look at, uh, you know, and so the S&P made new highs and is now just bouncing back uh, uh, at the end of the week to kiss its breakout. NASDAQ has been clearly the leader. Um, it's it's only as of Friday, I guess, given back half of the run of the last two weeks. But if you look at the, you know, the Dow, uh, the transports, the Russell, they really haven't done much in this last three or four weeks. The uh, the Dow eked out a marginally higher high and is now starting to work its way down towards support already. Um, the transports and the Russell failed to break out on the most recent rally, and they're looking looking pretty heavy. So. The, uh, you know, I'd be looking for the S&P probably to pull back to its 50-day average, and that's, uh, and we'll see how it reacts from there. But until you've got uh, a good hard break and then a rally to a lower high, getting a failure in, I would say, the uh, the S&P, um, you know, trend is still up, but it is, uh, it's rolling a bit, it's looking tired, and. Uh, the money clearly has been moving to a couple of other places, and the number one and two out of that, and we talked about uh, this a week ago, um, gold market <clears throat> went through just a, a really nice triangular-shaped consolidation uh, since the end of January, um, gave back about uh, just a Fibonacci 38% of the rally off the November low, held well came back and tested it again, and in this last uh, five or six days, has managed to tack on $90. Um, so not only a good breakout in U.S. dollars, but, you know, all-time highs as far as the you know, against the euro, the Canadian dollar, the Japanese yen. And um, the pattern there looks good, probably has uh, another couple of weeks left in this part of the run, so you might want to, you know, just uh, hold on to positions there. There's... We had recommended fairly tight stops a week and a half ago, 
I don't think there's any reason to raise the stops as of yet. And we've got a U.S. dollar that uh, has a bit of a reversal at the end of the week. And uh, it, it's been in this rising channel, uh, in particular since, uh, I guess, September of 2018, um, at about the same time uh, that the gold market bottomed out. So the two have been rallying together. But um, the, the dollar seems to have turned over. Uh, the bond market, though, um, U.S. 10-year yields down to um, 1.47%. That's testing the lows of the last couple of years, which in that case are the lowest lows that we've seen in at least 60 or 70 years. So um, there's uh, there's a lot of um, flight on terms of capital these days. Ross, thank you so much for uh, chatting with us. Yes. And we shall be with you a week from now. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. Coming up, Joseph Schachter, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Joseph Schachter, founder of Schachter Energy Report Online at SchachterEnergyReport.ca. He's speaking to us from Calgary. Welcome back to the show, Joseph. My pleasure, Jim. Good to be with you. Is this COVID-19 coronavirus the black swan event everybody feared when it came to oil and gas? I think it's still too early to tell because, you know, we're, we're, number one, it's expanded beyond China. Singapore uh, and Korea are facing, you know, significant bumps in China, Japan as well. So we're now, you know, 75, 76,000 cases, uh, 2,300 uh, fatalities. So the numbers just keep on going up. You know, if we, today's the, the 21st, but if you go back to just the 20, the 10th, so 11 days ago, it was 40,000 cases and 910 deaths. So we're now, you know, um, almost double the number of cases, but more than double the number, 2,300 versus 910 on the number of fatalities. So this thing is still not over. And with China now saying they want to get their economy back on stream, a lot of companies have said that they don't have enough medical to test the employee, you know, the employees that they come back. And then when they do come back, they may, they may be a carrier of the virus, even though they don't have the virus in terms of the, you know, the health issues of the, um, of, uh, you know, in terms of the, the high temperatures and, and, you know, lung issues. Um, and so there's still a lot of unknowns here. The fact that it's picking up, uh, not in China, but in, you know, but in Japan, Korea, and, and Singapore is, is, is disconcerting. And then there's more deaths occurring outside of China. And then what they're finding out is that when they look at the demographics, it's older people who are smokers and more men than, than, than female, males than females that are being impacted. And so countries in Asia with a high uh, level of uh, smoking are more impactful than, you know, let's say OECD countries that have been banning smoking for a number of years. So this thing has still uh, got a lot of unknowns. The price of crude oil, uh, you know, was at 65, 65 in early January when the Iranian um, um, uh, general who was the terror master was 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 assassinated uh, by the drone attack and we went down to 49 US 4931 for WTI in early February since then we bounced uh, to you know the 54 area uh, you know uh, because of the talk of China coming back to work but with now more cases and and more you know and and the and the extent of it going to other countries there's now a concern that this thing is uh, is is maybe not uh, being uh, managed properly, and we haven't seen the peak in uh, in terms of cases and deaths. So um, I think there's a rethink going on, and also people concerned that you know everybody talks about 14 days. Well, 14 days gets over, and then you know we're going to be back to work, and days are going to be back to normal. 
but it's 14 days from the, from the next case. So if you have a new case that comes on, the clock ticks again, you know. And if and if somebody goes back to work and 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 then they they show the case, then you had another 14 days. So any time there's a new experience, you have to start the clock all over again, and the clock has now been moving for almost three months. Now, you know, people wonder with the most of the impact being in China, how much of the world oil market was China at the start of this and how much has it fallen? Well, China uh, consumes about 14 million barrels a day. They produce about four, so they import about 10. They were fully stocked up beforehand. So the issue now is have they lost uh, in Q1 two or three or four million barrels of demand? Uh, you know, you look at the pictures when they show you at, at night on the news, you know, the, the the traffic in the streets is not like it normally is. <laughs> One benefit is cleaner air for them. But uh, but the, the, you know, the number of people on the streets is not there because they're all still at home. Uh, you know, they may be going out for food, but they're wearing their masks and then coming home. So, um, and a lot of people are now working from home rather than from from work. But when you're in a manufacturing plant, you've got to work in the manufacturing plant versus, you know, office jobs or white collar jobs, which you could probably do remotely. So we still don't know the impact. The impact, uh, you know, is China going to have negative quarterly growth in Q1? Um, you know, is the um, you know what's going to happen with manufacturing uh, in terms of recovery? Will it change supply chains where people say, you know, I don't want to be so, um, you know, tied into just China? Maybe I need to expand where where I where I have my supply chain. So this thing has got a lot of unknowns, and um, you know, my concern is if we back off and break that forty nine thirty one of early February, which was the low so far. Um, I think then we may could we you know and if the number of cases picks up the number of fatalities, the economic impact and concerns uh, you know and a lot of companies are now talking about uh, you know the, the virus having uh, you know COVID D uh, COVID nineteen having significant impact on their economic prospects and 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 future outlooks. Um, that if we bust forty nine thirty one, it's possible we could go down to the low forties. That would be very damaging, and I think. Uh, um, you know, the worst for the energy sector may not be over worldwide. And then in Canada, we have some of our own problems, which I think you want to talk about. Well, so much of Canada's uh, oil is shipped by rail, and we have multiple rail blockades, so-called in the name of the wet sewer and people. But uh, having talked to sources who are in contact with the actual First Nations in northern British Columbia, they're not in favor of these protests. They say, who are you to speak on our behalf? They're embarrassed by them. And what's more, it has cut off the benefits they were receiving from the pipeline construction, such as community centers and social housing. So the people who supposedly are against this, we also found out uh, from Stuart Muir from the Resource Work Society that the five hereditary chiefs who are against the project ran for native council in the area and lost. Yeah, and I think that is something that that really has to be exposed so that people understand that uh, that the opposition it, there's basic reasons behind it. Uh one in the case that you mentioned the five hereditary chiefs who ran for band council and lost. And there's others where um there's disenchanted uh, uh people who are being paid by um US economic interests that want to see Canada be you know continue to be a hostage to the U.S. Uh, for uh, our our production, and that they don't want to see us having markets in Europe and in Asia. And so there, you know, Vivian Krauss has done a lot of work on that. And I think you know there's been articles recently about some of these uh, leading group uh, protesters being paid significant amounts of money, fifty thousand dollars, I think, is one example uh, for one of the protesters to 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 be in opposition and lead others. Um, you know, to, to stop the uh, moving ahead um, of these projects. The, the basic issue is, I, you know, I don't think the prime minister is going to resolve this, um, you know, by, uh, by uh, you know, letting this play out over months. The Canadian economy can't handle that. I think, uh, you know, one, if we get to the end of February, which is, again, not far from where we are now, you know, a week away, um, you get into early March and companies continue to lay off people, I think it's going to be, um, you know, very and 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 if you're on one of, one of the lands of the First Nations, and you don't have, you know, if you if you're putting blockades in, 
food's not coming into your into your uh, you know in, into your uh, home sites uh, into the stores there. So you're going to be at some point without propane, without food. It's going to start impacting them as well from a quality of life. But I think the Canadian government is going to have to, uh, you know, say that, look, uh, let's go to the courts, let's get a, a, a ruling from the courts. And I think they have to go back to this whole issue of First Nations and how, you know, uh, how things are ruled and, and uh, get uh, an agreement, uh, you know, sit down with the First Nations, uh, both the hereditary and the elected, and say, look, you guys have to have a system where, um, you know, the majority rules and that a small minority of uh, maybe non-elected uh, individuals do not have the right, uh, you know, there is no, um, you know, ace of spades if you're playing, uh, you know, if you're playing spades, that uh, you can trump it and, and say uh, game over and, uh, you know, you're not even a, a large percentage of the um, of the population of the of the First Nation. So I think at some point, you know, the, the democratic requirements that we have as a nation here in Canada where majority rules, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, you have a riding, and the person who gets the most number of votes is in. Uh, it's not where you have pro, you know, pro rationa and, and uh, you know, pro, you know, or you know, which is what the Green Party has wanted in BC. You know, where you know, if you get a certain population of the vote, you get a certain number of of the um, MLAs um, or MPs federally. Um, I, you know, I think that the majority rule has to come into play, but I think the Prime Minister has to be, you know, has to come to a decision that uh, th- this is not something that he can leave alone. He has to come to get this thing uh, resolved, and, he, you know, he should be inviting in the First Nations leaders from across the country and saying, look, the, you know, the agreements we had before didn't uh, take into account this problem. We have to come up with a solution. Um, you know, he, you know, you guys need to come up with some ideas. Here are some ideas that we have. And let's find a way to change the law so we encompass these extra problems that were not envisioned at the time we came up with the prior agreements. We'll have more with Joseph Schachter right after the break. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Joseph Schachter. Joseph, long term, what are the uh, outlooks for Canadian oil and gas if this can be resolved or will this uh, problem with blockades and so on be a long term thing? Or is that something you just can't predict? Uh, let's talk about t- t- two areas. One, world, the world environment for energy, and then we'll talk about the Canadian issues that are domestic uh, concerns. On the international side, $50 oil, you know, we're 53, 54, you know, or so today, is not sufficient for the industry to replace the production. We're seeing in the United States where um, the production has not grown. It's 13 million barrels. It hasn't been able to grow above that. The shale numbers are, you know, the are are growing a little bit in the Permian, but four of the seven uh, shale play areas are not growing at all and are declining already. And we're seeing from the rig count that we're that we're seeing uh, declines in the rig count. Um, and so the amount, uh, you know, I think if you look at the rig count, um, you know, for the oil side in the United States, um, let me just see if I can pull that number up. The the for the for the oil side. Um, the number of rigs declined in the states. Um, uh, this is last week Friday's data. Um, today's data I haven't seen yet. Um, the U.S. rig count is 790 rigs, down from 105 one a year ago, down 25 percent. And the number of oil well uh, rigs is down by 21 percent. And the number of rigs drilling for natural gas is down by 43 percent. So you're looking at um, the U.S. rig count coming down. By the pressure um, of Wall Street saying, "Look, you guys have to show you can make money for investors," um, and companies saying, "Look, the number of wells we're drilling are not as productive. Our tier one wells that we're drilling now are not as good as our previous tier ones." So you're talking about kind of parent-child wells. So the worldwide side, um, U.S. is not going to be increasing production by a million barrels in 2020 as a forecast. It may only be a couple hundred thousand at most. It may even be a decline if we have these lower prices that I think are possible. 
And then Saudi Arabia has changed its game plan. In the past, Saudi Arabia was a market share player and drove OPEC for market share. Now Saudi Arabia, because of Aramco, is now interested in much higher prices because they want Aramco stock to do well because over time they want to sell more shares of Aramco to diversify their economy. So Aramco uh, has, has been a game changer in terms of the world environment. And so we're going to see, by lack of in capital investment and by restrictions by OPEC of production, and then not taking into account the problems of Libya and, and Venezuela, which are which are serious in, in their own right, that we're going to be probably be looking at higher commodity prices for crude oil in the second half of 2020, which will be beneficial to Can Canadian companies as well as U.S. companies because of the lack of production and the fact that there's tight supply demand. Um, if the coronavirus, um, you know, COVID D gets worse and extends into Q2 and Q3, that probably, you know, will be delayed. Uh, but it'll mean the industry will spend less money because, you know, they'll be having lower prices and they'll be even more curtailing uh, CapEx, which will, you know, exacerbate the situation when the uh, COVID-19 coronavirus uh, gets under control. On terms of the Canadian side, um, we probably are not going to see much um, new, you know, the, the TMX issue still has uh, problems with land access and, and in terms of the lower mainland and the Surrey area for the terminals. So even though the federal government has won the court case, they still need to get the land that they need, and that is still an issue that has to be resolved. Um, I think the LNG coastal gas line, you know, at the end will be resolved um, and will be built, maybe with some delay, but will be built. But the TMX uh, still has some very serious problems, and it's mainly the lower mainland where um, the, you know, the land issues uh, have to be resolved and and are not easy to resolve, um, especially given the opposition in those in those um, in those markets. Now, we've already had a uh, high court ruling saying that local governments cannot overrule uh, federal jurisdiction, which is pipelines that cross provincial boundaries. How can they tie it up, or is it just uh, we can tie you up in procedural stuff like building permits? Well, uh, it could be that from the government side, but the, the other thing is, you know, you've got to go over land that could be, you know, B.C. Crown, it could be city land, so you've got to go through all the hurdles of, of forcing them to abide. I think the more difficult ones are going to be the individual landowners, where they need if they if the routing that they want to take requires expropriation of land that's owned by farmers or or even going through urban areas, um, that could be very problematic. And um, and I, I don't know the answer to that. I just think it's going to take time. And it's going to require the courts to get involved, uh, and it, you know that to me is really the disconcerting thing that uh, um, the land was not fully bought by TMX before, so that they can say we have the route, we have the land, and and now it's just we need a court ruling saying yes or no, and with the court ruling saying yes, then we would be moving forward. Uh, the fact is that you know, and, and TMX says this uh, that uh, we still do not have all the land we need, and that to me is problematic if it's not federal, provincial, or local, where the courts have ruled that that can be done and expropriated for the benefit of building the national pipeline owned by the federal government. Uh, another uh, choke point, right now a lot of crude oil is transported by rail cars, but there's a shortage of space on the railways and uh, do they have enough tanker cars to really move as much oil as is demanded? Yeah, I think for the oil side, remember, Eastern Canada imports a lot of oil from uh, by shipping uh, from from um, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, uh, you know, other countries, uh, uh, Colombia, etc. You know, are, are shipping there, so oil doesn't seem to be the problem. The rail portion, you know, that comes from Western Canada can be replaced over time. So, but the problem I'm hearing is that propane is in short supply. And if you remember, uh, when there was propane shortages a number of months ago, um, you know, when the rails did not have the dis disruption, Pemina had a full train load of, of, uh, of uh, propane that was, you know, that was sent uh, to uh, the eastern Canadian markets to resolve the problem of very, very expensive propane because of the shortages. Now with the, um, with the problem where you have, um, you know, the rail strikes, um, that just makes it more problematic for product uh, where that can't be imported on the East Coast uh, as easily as you can crude oil 
for the refineries in, 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 in Quebec and Ontario. Do you think uh, people in Quebec will come around to the point of view where uh, a pipeline from Western Canada would make a lot of sense? What, what's interesting is, um, you know, the, the debate right now about climate change right now only looks at the oil and gas industry what se- and because of the CO2 emissions. What seems to be happening by the climate, um, you know, um, experts is that methanes are just as problematic as the CO2s are, and in some cases you could argue are even worse. Um, and the methanes uh, are a problem when you're building hydroelectric facilities and when you have cement plants. And so with the expansion of hydroelectric in Quebec, the major project that's going on in Labrador, if all of a sudden the climate uh, and uh, numbers include methane as well as they include the CO2 emissions, then all of a sudden what we thought was a solution, which is hydro, does not become a solution and becomes problematic. And it becomes where one where you say, well, we can't build any more hydro, number one, because, of course, the, the land expropriation from the First Nations uh, and the water damage but and the removal of trees. But the other one is, of course, the methane emissions, which become serious. So I'm not a scientist, but I'm reading more and more about the issue of methane and that uh, cement plants and, and the hydro do have a uh, significant impact, and they are no longer um, going to be considered in, in future environmental reports from the UN that, um, that, uh, that that hydro is a solution. It becomes one of the problem ones like coal and like oil and gas and, you know, other fossil fuels, uh, coal, etc. Um, you know, the one big one is, is you know, if, if we want to make progress is close down the uh, you know the 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 the, the high polluting sulfurous coal and Canada is moving pro- and making progress on it, but unless China and India play ball, um, whatever we do in Canada is a non is a non issue and has a, and no impact on the full global scene. And so um, you know the the excesses that we're talking about in Canada are just marginal improvements if if China and India don't join the party. Uh, and I don't see any way that pressure can be brought. On those countries to uh, to meet the climate uh, goals, um, because you know their economies uh, just are not, and and their democracies or lack of democracies uh, don't 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 give any reason for that they'll accept the pressure. Japan is building over twenty coal-fired plants to replace the atomic plants that were shut down because of the tsunami, and I don't think Japan's worried about rising sea levels because they have a thirty-foot wall around their country. You know, that, that's part of the quandary. You know, we, we talk about all the things we want to do in Canada. We talk about all what the, you know, the climate, uh, you know, leaders are saying, here's what we want to do. But then an industrial country like Japan, which realizes the long-term problems from, you know, what do you do with the fuel rods and, and nuclear, plus, of course, all the issues of earthquakes and, and, and the problems that that causes. So they're saying in our country, we're not going to do nuclear power. Germany is saying the same thing. But what are they doing is we're building more coal in Japan. We're building more coal and using more coal in Germany. So tell me if that, if that solves the problem. It's, it's nuts. Joseph, uh, how would you sum up the energy situation right now then? I'm in a holding pattern. Like I think the, the area and the stocks are extremely cheap. But I think because of the uh, COVID-19, because of my concern about you know what that does to the economy, because I'm concerned that we may break that U.S. 4931 WTI price in the next few weeks if the data from the COVID is 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 negative, uh, I think there's you know that people who own stocks should stay with the names because they're very very cheap, but hold off in, uh, putting cash back in and investing even further. Um, because I think that we, you know, the COVID thing is, is, is just getting worse. Um, but there's going to be a fabulous buying time sometime in the next, uh, few months. And so we're, uh, we're continuing to do our focus on the, on the fundamentals of individual companies and, and, and letting our subscribers know what's going on with them as they report their fourth quarter results and saying these are the winners that, you know, these are the, the ones that are the strongest companies. Uh, because once we get through this, and we move into you know sixty sixty five dollar oil later this year seventy dollars in 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 the twenty twenty one period um, these stocks will do extremely well 
and investors in them uh, will do well. And in the meantime, many of them are, are offering fabulous dividend yields. Uh, you know, some of them are 8 to 10%. Uh, so they're darn cheap right now, and the balance sheets in many cases are, 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 are in great shape. So the, the, key, the key thing is, is that we're sitting, um, you know, with very, very cheap stocks, but we don't have the catalyst to make them not be cheap. And that really is, a, is the equation. We need to get uh, a, a little more clear-sightedness on the economy uh, going forward worldwide. We need to see a little more clearance on the, uh, the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, and that it's finally under control and there's the case, number of cases is, begin, is declining and that uh, the recovery rates are there. Uh, that'll be another issue. And then here's one more is, you know, if the Democrats somehow are able to, to, to put through a candidate that becomes competitive with Trump, they're against fracking in the United States and they're against drilling on federal lands. That is going to cause, uh, you know, higher oil prices because the U.S. will no longer be able to grow its business, which it's done, you know, uh, over the last five, six years they all of a sudden will see a decline, and all of a sudden being self-sufficient in energy, they will not be self-sufficient um, under a democratic regime if it's Bernie Sanders and, and the views that he's, uh, that he's pontificating. Joseph, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. My pleasure. My guest has been Joseph Schachter, founder of Schachter Energy Report online at schachterenergyreport.ca. He was speaking to us from Calgary. Coming up, Danielle Park. Next on This Week in Money. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications. Patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council, Incorporated. Welcome back to the show, Danielle. Thank you, Jim. Danielle, we're seeing a lot of red boards and so many people saying the equity markets perhaps are in for uh, a correction, maybe a giant correction, which, of course, we would call a a recession or depression, but what can a person do when you're in this kind of atmosphere where we're not really sure what's going to happen? Well, we're never sure what's going to happen. To be quite honest, any idea that we have certainty about things is farcical, but we do know probabilities of uh, certain patterns repeating when certain indicators have been confirmed many times throughout centuries of data. And, you know, certain indicators around, for example, the valuation of assets, has been historically quite reliable in terms of mean reversion over time. We don't know exactly when that will occur, but the further and further you get away from uh, sort of the long-term norms, the more likely it is to go through an abrupt reversal. And so, yes, this has been an unprecedented expansion um, because, you know, we've had 20 years now of a secular bear market where uh, asset prices began from all-time historic highs in 2000 in the tech bubble top. And then we had the collapse into 2002 3 which was a 78% loss in the tech sector. All the big names, Apple, you know, um, Microsoft, all the ones people widely held and overloved back then, just as they are today. Uh, they all persevered as business models. They all went on to be leaders over the next decade. But their collapse in stock price was still you know, in the 70 to 80% range. That's very typical when you get into this kind of disconnect between asset prices and the underlying actual earnings of companies and the underlying business cycle, the credit cycle, which drives the business cycle, and that's a global phenomenon. So what we do know is that this, you know, when the, when the uh, market started to wobble in 2012, 13, which was probably the natural sort of organic top that it would have come to in the aftermath of the 08 crisis and the collapse then that happened of more than 50% in asset prices at that point, you know, coming out of a, out of a low where markets had really at that point made nothing for 12 years. And that's typical in this environment. When the correction comes, it's like it sets you back to where prices were 12 years before that. Um, so, um, but when that happened, 
it sort of brought things back to fair value or long-term sort of normal value, not undervalued. We never got there in the last cycle because of all the interventions that took place, the central bank efforts. And then, of course, when they started the QE interventions in 2011, 12, 13, then it was just relentless. Every time the stock market began to wobble or roll down, they, you know, funneled more cash in. And that's exactly what's happened in the last year as well. Um, when the sell-off took place in the last quarter of 2018, um, the central banks punched in a bunch more liquidity and we saw rallies through 2019, you know, extraordinarily strong recovery from the low in 18. And then you've seen that same sort of excess go on on a daily basis pretty much. In the last you know, sort of five months, we've seen central banks, particularly the U.S. Fed, intervene almost daily uh, with interjections of billions of dollars into the banking system, um, again, primarily to float over-levered hedge funds and, inter- and financial intermediaries who have been borrowing money cheap and speculating in financial assets. So whenever they get a, a crunch where they can't get uh, more debt, where they are having funding problems, um, they are at risk of having to sell assets because they're highly levered. And once they begin to sell assets, of course, that drives down prices. So the Fed is so terror, terror, terrified of having uh, any actual correction happen in the markets that it continues to, to dump cash in. Now, this is obviously a finite exercise, albeit a very long-running one that they've done, but it's not as if it's a, it's a sustainable uh, business model over the long term. And, in fact, the problem is that the markets have become so complacent, so uh, addicted, so overconfident that the Fed's placebo, and it is a placebo, it's not an actual cure for anything, it's just making people think that, you know, that someone's got their back or that risk is no longer, uh, you know, um, a, a, a thing they have to be worried about or that valuations no longer matter. I mean, we've got the, the, the lowest short interest on the S&P 500, that means the, the trading community is betting the least against a decline in the U.S. stock market of any time since 2007, the last time they were obscenely overconfident, overvalued, overlevered, and of course we know what happened then. So if you're looking at this in terms of what should an individual do, I say that an individual has to use the opportunity to take a really sober look at their own finances, to realize that we're in a casino-style speculative mania today and that, you know, most of the people in the world are not doing well financially. The speculators, the people who have, you know, got use of free money from the Fed to trade, which is something that, you know, this category of trading is certainly not investing. It's typically either front-running things on a short-term window with algorithms or it's, you know, just taking obscene amounts of risk and hoping that you don't blow up before you're able to cash out. Well, this is not actually an investment strategy that anyone in the real world can undergo, and they're trying to manage their own financial resources to meet their own timeline. It's also not a strategy that pensions can even successfully use, because if, if, if you've noticed, even in the last you know, longest recovery now, the last decade where asset prices have been continually pushed up, we still have these massive deficits and liabilities and pension plans and other critical, you know, institutions all over the world. And this is before this next bear market comes. So um, it's going to get worse, right? There's no chance that these asset prices are going to levitate indefinitely at these record highs, which have only been surpassed, if, if at all, once in human history, which was in the tech rec top of 2000. Um, you know, if you look at things like the U.S. market cap to U.S. GDP, as an example, we're at the same high as we were in 2000 when things crashed, uh, you know, violently thereafter for a couple of years. Um, and even if we look at global market, you know, sometimes people think, well, I could certainly I could own, you know, stocks or corporate debt in other countries. Um, but even if you look at that, this has been such a, a worldwide epidemic of of risk taking and leverage that global market cap to global GDP is basically very close to the peak it was in 2000 and 2008 as well. So these are very formidable tops that one should pay attention to. You know, as I've said many times, boomers today are, the bulk of them are already into their, what they assumed would be their retirement years. Many have arrived there with much less money than they needed, and that was a function of not saving enough and also taking too much risk through the last 20 years where they've repeatedly blown up and then spent years trying to grow back their losses. And They've done that again this cycle. Um, 
so you have to be sort of very practical in the sense that you don't have another, you know, if you're already into your 50s, 60s, 70s, you don't have another 12 to 14 years to wait for prices to come back once they mean revert again. And we've set up, you know, I mean, if you look at anyone who's been doing this a long time, more than just uh, this cycle or traders or, you know, um, very young, fresh-faced people that populate the financial media, uh, typically have not much cyclical experience. And if you look at sort of the people that have been around a long time, just Warren Buffett as one example, he currently has the, at Berkshire Hathaway, they have $122 billion in cash. He underperformed the S&P by something like 20% in 2019, just as he did in 2007. Um, because, you know, our 2000, just before the last downturn, because, or 1999, another time, when, you know, anyone that's got a value discipline and is actually trying to invest ends up not being able to buy things because they're all so infected with this mass uh, overvaluation disease. And so you have to be very um, disciplined in saying, well, I'm not going to buy junk uh, and pay, you know, good money after bad. I'm going to be very controlled in the way in which I expose myself to this cycle and I'm I'm gearing all of this so that I have liquidity to buy things when everyone else is selling. Because although the mass of people that are holding or even the funds, the ETFs, this has been a huge bubble in passive allocations. The ETF market has gone trillions of dollars uh, up in the last five years even just as all this free money has been floating around the system. But these are price indiscriminate buyers. These are fund flows that have come in with no one actually paying attention to how concentrated they've become. You know, the top five uh, U.S. companies now comprise more than $5 trillion of market cap. Um, and that top five is the same old culprits, the, you know, the Apple, Am- uh, Amazon, um, uh, Alphabet, Microsoft, uh, Facebook. These These five companies now comprise more value than the entire German stock market. Like these are all glaring flags about bubble valuations. Um, and these companies are now priced for the expectation that they're going to be able to double their um, earnings again over the next decade. Um, and the thing is that we're in this wave here where everyone's appreciating, you know, that they've taken a lot of liberty with personal data, that they've basically sold trust, um, that they've been very unregulated, and you see this wave of antitrust sentiment that's global. You've got 27 countries today considering digital taxing, um, d- digital taxes. You've got a bunch of uh, anti-competition and privacy uh, suits and regulatory reviews all up. So the chances of their profits continuing at this pace over the next decade is very low. Um, and you know, moreover, the rest of the companies are struggling. You're seeing a lot of slowdowns, a lot of closures, bankruptcies, Pier 1 this week, you know. So this is the kind of thing the real per- that a, a, an actual person has to look at and say, how much of my life savings do I want to have in a Ponzi scheme? How much can I afford to lose without suffering a setback in my lifestyle or my uh, retirement plan? And really um, use your head, you know, Keep, stick to math. It does matter. And um, reevaluate your exposure to these bubbles. And and now is the time to do it, not after prices have crashed. You know, now is the time to take a sober reflection and say, okay, I need someone who's going to have a look under the lid of these fancy wrappers. You know, they put all the, the basically the same large companies are inside all these products which have been rolled out in the last decade. So it's the, you're not getting different things when it's wrapped in a package called the, you know, dividend conservative fund, income fund versus the growth and income fund versus, these are all just marketing labels but inside you actually got the same companies in an incredibly concentrated way today so you're not diversified and you're not protected by holding assets of different countries because we're all caught up in this same uh, toxic cycle at the moment so you really have to keep things in short term you know deposits things that protect principal um, and and keep things mostly in your home currency where you pay your bills um, you have to reevaluate your exposure to the real estate market and make sure you're not speculating there. You know, if you've got some real estate that you're living in, make sure it's the right size and fit for you for the next five to ten years. If it's not, now is the time to evaluate 
how you might be able to lower your expenses, um, make yourself more efficient on that front. So there's lots of things an individual can do, and I wrote a big article about that, reviewing financial plans uh, today on the blog, and I think that people, if they look at that, they can use it as a sort of a, a checklist to go through. What would be tops on that checklist? Uh, tops. Well, um, tops is, I, you know, Sorry, but tops is invest in your health and education. That's tops. Uh, health, and that includes mental health. Um, you know, coming up with uh, some idea of what you stand for, what you want in terms of your life design and pattern, where you're headed. That's all kind of. It sounds touchy feely, but it's foundational. And the second thing is then organizing your finan- finances to match with your goals and aspirations in that regard. So making sure that. You don't have a bunch of debt to fund a bunch of consumption lifestyle, uh, you know, things that look fancy but actually are not wealth building over time, um, are actually, you know, depreciating assets or are, you know, if you've got, as I say, all the trappings of, of wealth but they're, you know, backed by debt, it's, uh, uh, it's a precarious thing you've built for yourself. So making sure that you're living within your means means no debt, pay off your expenses, uh, spend less than you make. Um, don't plan to retire early uh, and the plan being, well, I'm going to take my savings and buy a bunch of risky assets and hope that it pays me an income as if I was working. This is a terrible time for that approach and that's what a lot of people have done. Again, they did it in 2000, they did it in 2008 and they did it again recently, you know, except now they're in their 60s, some of them, and they're, they're hoping that they can, or they've just left work or they're hoping to leave work and they're looking at financial plans that the financial sales crowd has given them, which suggests they can take out five or six percent a year if they hold these dividend paying things. Well, these dividend paying things are the stuff that's going to blow up. And they're going to take chunks of your capital with it. And then you're going to be in, in a very precarious scenario because even though the plan may be to hold through any downturn, the reality is most people don't. Uh, psychologically, emotionally, they don't. And also, it's very difficult to withdraw income from funds once they've dropped in value a lot. It's very psychologically challenging. Um, and people all tend to sell after they've lost money, and then they're really set back, right? Then they're years and years away from the goals that they had. So that would be really, it would be, I think that would be the, the first few things one needs to look at. Danielle, green energy, of course, it is the trends that so many people are telling us about. What are some of the latest things that are happening uh, to get us away from fossil fuels? Well, there's a lot. Uh, it's probably, uh, you talk about a, a bull, a bull topic where, you know, things are just flying through the roof every week. But I think the biggest takeaway that, um, that I would suggest, there's technological advancements and innovation. There's all sorts of new startups and venture projects. There's a lot of, of government and, and business partnerships. There's, you know, a lot of it is in the smaller and medium sized space because a lot of the behemoths are sort of stuck with sunk costs and antiquated technologies and they're sort of been reluctant to make the shift over and write off some of their current things that they've invested in as bad assets. But, you know, I think that the fundamental thing that I talk about and people, you know, that don't get it will often say, oh, you know, that's not financial. You shouldn't be talking about that. But my point and Mark Carney's point, frankly, who the former Bank of Canada uh, governor and who went to lead the Bank of England, his point continues to be this is essentially foundational to financial success, that we make this transition, that companies understand that they aren't going to be able to continue to pollute and um, emit and, you know, have all these ways Waste products and not um, have to uh, discount that or take that into account in their expense structure going forward. So, in other words, they've got away with, you know, producing all these uh, harmful byproducts and leaving that on the public purse or not having it priced at all and just, you know, considering their their cash flow profits. And we're in this environment where everything's having to be repriced. We've got a carbon tax, for example, in Canada. That's not going away. That's going to have to increase because it's drastically low relative to what it needs to be for accurate market pricing of that emission. So that's just one area. But, you know, um, packaging pollution is another area where we're having more and more rules come in to reconnect the producer with the aftermath or having to take responsibility for their waste. So those are going to function as a cost that's going to be added in. Um, so it's it's all about, you know, looking at the reality of this and realizing that 
you know, we're going to be in an entirely different world uh, over the next 10 years. And the transition is happening a lot faster than people think. And there's a massive upfront investment required. And the whole structure is about we have to get more efficient. We have to get more efficient with our resource utilization. That's the driving force behind this is actually financial. Yes, environmentally it's really important because people are getting very sick from, uh, you know, the emissions of, for example, tailpipe emissions. There was a, a study done uh, out of uh, UBC uh, that was just published on the connection between dementia and Parkinson's disease and emissions uh, proximity and where you live close to highways, as an example. So there's all kinds of, 50% of the asthma cases in Canada are connected to, you know, the air pollution, air quality issues. So there's all kinds of reasons, where it, whether it's healthcare burden on the system, which is crushing at the moment, um, uh, water problems, which are going to increase. So all of these things have to take into account. It's a new way of measuring success, frankly, is not just in terms of how many drugs you're selling, which has been the old model, uh, but how many, you know, how healthy the, the population is and what costs we're averting. So in this in this sense, um, there's only upside, frankly, um, and there's tons of new jobs, there's tons of investment opportunity in this, um, but it is a transition that is happening, and the people that, you know, Mark Carney was saying this week that the smart money gets it, and he means by that that the people that are looking forward instead of back, like all of these ideas, all these political platforms that want to take us back to some idea of what things used to be are are misguided and are not going to be successful. We, you know, we're we're the the population is getting larger on the earth. On the earth, it's not getting smaller. None of these issues are going to resolve themselves without a lot of innovation and investment. And so, old ideas are really out of step with where we're headed here. So it's just a question of embracing the change, looking for the opportunity, looking for the savings, because there's tons to be had here in doing things with less waste uh, and less um, harm and the costs that flow from that. So it's actually, it's it's the mega, mega investment theme of the next 20 years for sure, um, but it's already underway right now. Uh, there are some environmental consequences as you make a change, uh, apparently, Wind farms are not all that healthy for birds and bats. They can chop up birds and bats, get their lungs burst by them. Are they finding solutions to the problems caused by giant windmills? I always get a kick out of this. I understand that no amount of, of no energy or no source is going to be without uh, complication and cost. Absolutely. But the, the fact of the matter is that cats kill far more birds every year, domestic house cats, than wind turbines would ever dream of killing. And I haven't heard anybody talk about outlying house cats. Do you know what I'm saying? And we're not even talking about the fact that so many uh, wildlife and, and birds are killed by tailing ponds and the pollution in water and air that we're creating from the current systems. So, you know, this hysterics around, well, these new technologies aren't perfect and they are going to cost a lot and they have some negative imp- impacts. Everything's relative, folks. You know, we're all alive on Earth, and our very presence means that we are uh, stressed for the natural world. It's a question of managing that stress with the least harm and the greatest efficiencies. So, you know, yes, there's there's some impact on birds. There's other uh, technologies which are developing which will be more effective and less harmful. Um, there's a lot of advancement that's currently happening. Even in the, in the incidence of battery storage, you know, the lithium-ion battery, people talk about what do we do with them afterwards, and there's, you know, uh, there's certain companies that are uh, recycling them. Um, you know, American Manganese, and Manganese is, a, is an example of one that's doing recycling of lithium-ion batteries, but there's others, and we're moving towards things like solid-state batteries, where you have much less uh, uh, negative uh, uh, chemicals left over when the battery life is expunged. So it's it's all a continuum of progress towards efficiency and improvement over time and yes we don't have the most ideal right now but we are sure as hell not in the most ideal in the current systems that we're using and the costs there are massive so it's all about you know reducing costs and and i'm sure if they had podcasts back at the turn of the last century when we were moving from horses to automobiles the same kind of debate would have been happening what's going to happen to all the blacksmiths you know, oh, of course. Yeah, the, course. the harness makers and so on. 
Yes, of course. And there's, you know, again, most people have a very difficult time looking forward. Everyone is very confident in, in things that are already apparent in the status quo and the facts at hand, and very few people are able to look forward. I heard an interesting stat yesterday at the dentist, and they said, How, what do you think the percentage of people who floss their teeth are, okay? First of all, we know that flossing your teeth has a massive reduction in the amount of plaque in your system, and we know that plaque is directly connected to um, cancers, to uh, um, heart disease. They're finding it in valves, all sorts of things. So mouth care is understood to be a massive contributor to whether or not you have certain propensity to disease. But what do you think the amount of people that actually floss their teeth daily is likely to be? Any guess? Uh, about 3%. <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> so even though we know that this is such a major factor, just 6% of the people are, have the self-discipline or, or the forethinking to actually take such a small daily step. So I'm just saying it's in our human nature to be kind of, uh, um, what's the words? Uh, you know, just not very forward thinking and forward looking. So, um, and my job is to actually be that way. I have to do that if I'm going to anticipate the environment and the climate that's coming financially. And if things are going to be viable, if we're investing in companies, it's very important that we understand whether they have a forward-looking plan. And the ones that are insistent on the backward-looking only are, are cease to exist. That's the very nature of, of competitive forces over time. So it's really important that we don't get stuck in that and that, yes, we realize that there's going to be costs and benefits and it's a question of, you know, having, um, improving that ratio as much as, as possible. On one of our previous podcasts, we uh, talked about a massive development in Alberta for solar energy. Can you maybe just uh, repeat what's happened there? Uh, well, there's so many projects right now. It's almost like a race to see who's got the biggest, you know, solar arrays, whether they're offshore, whether they're, um, yes, in southern Alberta, there's one. Florida's rolling out massive ones. There's many offshore now. Um, and they are producing, uh, you know, electricity for hundreds of thousands of homes, for example, in each project. And, uh, you know, there's all different technologies for solar power p- uh, panels and, you know, again, it's, it's, it, to, it, we don't have all the answers. Things will inevitably be better five years from now and five years later and five years after that in terms of the technology, but it's made leaps and bounds. And importantly, the cost has come down so dramatically. So that is uh, something that will be very helpful because as we go into this phase now where we're not adding just, where you can't just continue to add more and more debt. Uh, and more and more financial speculation and expect that to solve problems. I mean, look at this whole, you know, the coronavirus just reminds us of the vulnerability of the human population and how susceptible we can be to the spread of things like viruses and what a shock that can be, how that can impact the world economy, which it is right now, right? But we already had a turn down in, in the world's growth over the past couple of years. The, the rate of growth has been much slower over the last decade than it was in any of the prior decades. You know, so the the whole global supply tra- chain um, revenue flow has been in a downtrend well before we had the the virus outbreak. So the topic I've been speaking about is the importance of not wasting and utilizing our resources so that we get the best value for the least output in this in, in this in these conditions. Because when you have less cash flow and you've already got a lot of debt service in the world, you have less you know, um, to, to direct to other things. And so that's why this investment in things that lower structural costs is critically important and to provide jobs. And these jobs are taking skilled labor from some of the uh, other um, industries which are in decline, and that's very important, right? So it's um, we've got a, a bunch of struggles ahead. No doubt, you know, that will be the case. But I think that on the other side of just the reconnection of, of uh, forward uh, financial projections of expectations of return, the reconnecting of that with something that's more realistic uh, and likely to be successful, and then the topping up of of contribution levels so that plans are sustainable over time. These will all be extremely healthy developments in restoring some viability in both, you know, the economy, but also in finances for companies and households. Danielle, before we go, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated? 
So Venable Park is an independent um, absolute return investment council service. We don't sell anything. We manage risk for clients. And we've been doing this since uh, 2003 when we were uh, from inception. And um, our goal is not to lose uh, less than a benchmark in a negative year. It's uh, not to lose money, period, and to have positive compounding over time. So it's quite a different approach to the, you know, mainstream, which is you try and race up with indexes and then race you, you race down with them and you end up you know with lots of activity and little progress ours is really about trying to preserve principal manage plans so that they actually turn out the way people hoped and um, that they have a, a financial plan that that matches their their life plan thank you so much for being on the show danielle thanks jim my guest has been danielle park editor of the popular blog juggling dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council, Incorporated. Coming up, Ed Steer next on This Week in Money. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Ed Steer, founder of EdSteerGoldAndSilver.com and a director of GATA, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. He's speaking to us from Merritt, British Columbia. Ed, welcome back to This Week in Money. Uh, Hi, Jim. Uh, Thanks for having me on and greetings to all your listeners. Ed, it looks like we had a pretty exciting two weeks for the price of gold, almost a hundred dollars higher. Well, it certainly has been exciting. There's no question about that. Uh, you know, uh, the smart money out there and the big money knows that uh, the Federal Reserve and uh, all the central banks of the world have to keep printing money, or the stock markets are going to crash and burn. And they've also got to keep uh, interest rates in line. And the yield curve uh, uh, on a positive slope, and uh, they're all realizing now that we're we're basically it's print or die mode, and uh, they're piling in, and the prices that's being re- certainly being reflected in the price uh, the last two weeks, and especially today. Are the rises in gold and silver connected with uh, seasonalities? Um, I'll, I'll tell you what. Right now, this is all uh, the, this is all flight to quality. Right now, um, there's no there's no seasonality involved in this at all. Right now, this is just a, a flight from paper assets to hard assets, and seasonality does not play is not playing a factor in this this at all at the moment. It's uh, it's all people running from paper to to physical. Mm-hmm. Now, the U.S. dollar's been going higher. Is this part of a move into safe havens like gold and silver? Well, you know, the, uh, as myself and other people have been saying, you know, the U.S. dollar is just basically the cleanest, dirty shirt in the laundry basket. And uh, it's been going higher as a sort of quote-unquote flight to quality as well. Um, as I've been pointing out in my column the last few days, the uh, U.S. dollar is hugely overbought. And today we had a bit of a correction, so um, I expect that if we uh, see uh, the dollar uh, continue to decline, gold prices will certainly uh, rise uh, along with that. So uh, is the U.S. dollar a flight to quality? Uh, I'll leave that up to you and your listeners to judge, but to me it certainly isn't. The Canadian dollar is still hanging around 75 cents, while the Australian dollar has really taken a beating because it's a resource-based uh, currency. How come the Canadian dollar hasn't followed suit? Well, uh, there's there's no question that all all currencies are taking a beating against the U.S. dollar. Uh, the Canadian dollar is, uh, you know, we, we have our oil that we export, and, uh, you know, Australia is heavy into iron ore and other other um, industrial commodities so they've been they've been hurt even more because they ship directly to China and uh, when China's down and out like they are right now they're going to get hit harder than we are uh, so uh, until the price of oil or commodity starts to improve uh, the uh, the prices uh, the values of the uh, so-called commodity producing nations are going to continue to languish in the toilet what are the latest commitment of traders' numbers for gold and silver? 
<laughs> the numbers just came out about uh, an hour ago, and we're now at a new record high short posi- commercial net short position in gold. It's uh, it's right off the charts. Uh, right now, the uh, the commercial traders are short 38.6 million ounces of gold uh, in the, in the COMEX futures market, which, like I said, is a new record high. And uh, the silver numbers were up way up there as well. It's not a new record for them, but <clears throat> it's still a horrendously high number. Um, and as I was talking to silver analyst Ted Butler on the phone about half an hour ago, and he says the CFTC should be drawn and quartered for allowing the market to get this outrageous. But uh, no, we're, we're at nosebleed levels in both silver and gold for a commercial net short position. The only way that uh, either, either two things are going to happen is the shorts are going to rush to cover or the uh, commercial traders are going to have to engineer the mother of all price declines so they can get out of this thing whole because right now they're the seven largest traders uh, are short about $7 billion um, right now and uh, it's just getting more and more extreme with every passing day as the price rises. What's happening in physical versus paper, gold, and silver? Well, the, the paper market, the, the physical gold market and the physical silver market, if you're looking at, um, you know, the retail market, there is no retail market right now. The, um, the retail market is way down from what it, what it was, um, last year. I know the U.S. mint sales are terrible. The Australian mint sales are doing better. Canada's doing okay. You know, the, the, the central banks of the world are still buying gold, uh, but they're not buying as much as they used to. I noticed that uh, Russia's central bank only added 200,000 ounces of gold to the reserves in um, in January, which and that report just came out yesterday. So the physical market is 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 relatively okay, but what you're seeing right now as the price rises is a is a flight to quality, and the gold and uh, is acting more like a currency now than it is a um, a physical commodity. How are the HUI and XAU indexes looking? Well, I'll tell you what, you know, if, if you take a look at them, you know, we're at a new record high price for gold, 1600 since, what, 2011? And the stocks, uh, whether they be the uh, gold equities or the silver equities, certainly haven't kept up to the, um, to the new, these new price highs at all. Uh, they're really languishing in the basement. They're certainly higher, of course. But they're not as high as they should be compared to where they were, say, when the prices were the, you know, this high like 10 years ago or so. Um, right now, we're in an equity market bubble. We're in an everything bubble, as everybody knows. And uh, most of the people that are chasing stocks right now are chasing stocks in the general equity markets like the, uh, the Dow and the Nikkei and uh, everything else that's going up right now. Uh, but once that psychology psychology changes you'll see um, people back into the precious metals market in a big way but right now they are underperforming that's for sure what indicators for gold and silver would signal a longer term bull run well you're looking at it right now i mean uh this everybody out there knows the central banks are in a print or die mode in order to keep interest rates down and the stock markets levitated and the smart money is now starting to vote with, uh, by going into the precious metals. And, uh, these are the, these are the long-term indicators are here right now. There's no question that, uh, the flight to quality is, is on and it's on in earnest. And it was going to get even more and more dramatic as time passes. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, you know, price of gold is going up and the price of silver is rising, but like, a, and the commercial net short positions are getting larger and larger. And despite the fact that for this rush to quality, if these commercial shorts decide that they're going to rig prices lower so they can get out of the short positions, we're going to see a big, big decline in the price of gold and the price of silver as they attempt to get out of their short positions. But if the prices do decline, that's the only reason because, like I said before, the, price, the flight to quality is definitely on, and if the prices do go down, this will be a buying opportunity extraordinaire because I think it will be the last time the prices uh, decline. Uh, Ted Butler, whose work I follow closely, says that uh, if they're able to get out of, if the commercials are able to get out of this hole, 
or mostly whole, it will be the last uh, engineered price decline we see before prices skyrocket. Is this time to go bargain hunting for junior gold miners? Oh, absolutely. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, before the thundering hordes show up, and they will at some point, um, this is the time to buy. Actually, the time to buy was like a year ago. That was when the, the uh, equities were really in the in the basement. And you know, they've they've gained a lot since. But um, if you take a a silver company which I follow, which I own shares in, Silver um, uh, First Majestic Silver. Um, their stock price is still well below what it was uh, a long, you know, many years ago. And all the precious metal equities out there, especially the juniors and the intermediate producers, are the bargains of a lifetime. And we'll look back at them two or three years from now and say, boy, I wish I'd bought more at the time. So if you're ever thinking of getting into the market or adding to your positions, uh, this would be the time. Ed, what's new with the Gold Antitrust Action Committee? Well, you know, you know, GATT has been around, what now, for 20 years, and we've been preaching the message at, you know, at various gold sh- conferences uh, over the years, whether it be Vancouver or New Orleans or Toronto, um, and there's not a single solitary soul out there that doesn't know that the prices of the precious metals are being actively managed and have been for the last couple of generations. And uh, so, you know, GATT's med- message has been successful. But uh, nobody wants to talk about it. The miners don't want to talk about it, and the um, you know most of the pundits that uh, you know, the gold so-called gold analysts out there don't want to talk about it. Uh, but you know the fact is that the message that GAD has been giving out, and that silver analyst Ted Butler and others have been giving out over the years, you know, has sunk home. Everybody knows what's going on. And as far as GAD is concerned, I know that uh, you know. You know, Chris, Bill, and myself, we're all doing interviews like this one. I know that Chris is going to Singapore and Hong Kong next month if it isn't canceled because of the uh, coronavirus. And he's going to be speaking at precious metal conferences there. So we're still very, very active out there and putting out the message. But, you know, everybody knows the message, whether they care to admit it or not. Ed, how can people find out more about your newsletter? Well, if they're interested, they can uh, just Google my name, Ed Steer, S-T-E-E-R, and my website will come up, and they can go to my sample column page, and they can read the uh, they can read the offering that they get. I have five columns a week, about two hundred and sixty dollar uh, two hundred and sixty columns a year, and the freight is U.S. one hundred dollars uh, if they're interested. Ed, thank you so much for being on this week in money. My pleasure, and uh, good afternoon to you, sir. My guest has been Ed Steer, founder of EdSteerGoldAndSilver.com. He's also a director of GATA, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. He was speaking to us from Merritt, B.C. Our conversation took place on Friday, February 21st. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Joseph Schachter, Danielle Park, and Ed Steer. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from American Manganese CEO Larry Ray. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Welcome back to the show, Larry. Thanks, Jim. Larry, you received some good news from the U.S. Department of Energy. What was it? Well, Jim, we actually gave them some good news. Uh, we tested some of the uh, scraps and the uh, disassembled material they sent us, and uh, we did three tests on the uh, on the uh, same material, and the highest was 99.72% purity. And uh, the others uh, read pretty good at uh, 98.91%, all of them within the battery margins, and uh, 99.27%. So we're very happy with those results, and I believe that they're very happy with them. 
And uh, so that's uh, one, you know, more click down the road for us, and uh, we just keep on going. I mean, uh, we're uh, getting some other interest from people that want to test uh, material. We'll see how that works out. And, you know, Jim, we're just going to keep plugging along. Not only that, but we got a lot of, we got an article in a publication called Metal Tech that, uh, was unsolicited, unsolicited, and, uh, we were never contacted about it, but I really like the article that they put out on, uh, recycling and American manganese. So I've attached that to the podcast. We're seeing other things like the, uh, Army is looking at uh, heavy duty lithium ion batteries. Uh, for future, in the future for use, uh, that means more product on the line for us. So, uh, that is uh, also excellent news and that is attached. And we also have a, uh, uh, attached a, the conference results, uh, from the, uh, from the, uh, round table that, uh, Zaka was involved in from, uh, Fully charged, and that was in the waste management publication. So we're getting lots of news out there. And what does that mean? We have a lot of exposure. We have a lot of exposure out there. We have interest from all over the world. Uh, in the uh, company's technology, I see the stock is starting to look like it wants to go. And so I, if I'm an investor, I'll certainly keep my eye on that. I think we've reached the... Uh, Turning point where recycling is now becoming uh, uh, a big part of the news and uh, has a lot of popularity out there. So we've got uh, patents, and and again, I've said this a thousand times, those patents are the most important thing the company owns. We've completed pilot te- plant testing, and we've de-risked the project significantly. And... Uh, you know, it's uh, it's got to make the shareholders happy, and I hope we're going to get a reward this year, sooner than later. So, uh, you know, it's uh, I'm excited. It's you know, it's uh, it's hard to keep my thoughts together. They're flying all over the place, but we're uh, we're totally happy with what's happening out there. Everybody's enthusiastic in here. Uh, everybody's putting their shoulder to the wheel. We have a very small staff, and uh, you know that uh, puts a lot of work on individuals within the within the uh, organization. But it's all good. I mean, the days fly by, and uh, you know, before you know it, it's Friday again, Jim, and here we are talking. So the results uh, certainly uh, help the uh, help the market along. They uh, obviously they like the news release. Uh, we. Uh, we're always going to have to deal with uh, predator trading. I know people don't like me to hear me say that, but it just happens to be very true. And uh, But, you know, there will come a time when uh, they pull back their horns and uh, the stock will uh, eventually run up, and I expect that sooner than later. So, you know, we're going to, uh, we're just going to keep pushing on the uh, on the envelope here. And I think everybody will have a good listen and a good uh, read on some of the attachments that we have. And, uh, you know, I explained that the news release was uh, taken from the one product and uh, three different tests. So, uh, you know, we in doing somebody else's work from work that they have uh, done on the recycling, uh, or actually I should say not recycling, but... Uh, Preparing the product, uh, such as shredding or whatever, whichever way they do, has its own set of problems going in. And so that's why it takes time sometimes to do some of these, uh, test works that we're doing for tier one companies or the DOE. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not in our control. We have to handle what we get. And, uh, but, you know, that will, uh, sooner or later we will get them to, uh, actually get down to a size that we can deal with in a very uh, efficient way and uh, so it's uh, it it takes a little time there's uh, everybody wants timelines Uh, is all I can tell you is there's going to be continuous work going on I hope to be able to uh, talk more about that at a future date but uh, anything that I talk about has to be in a press release so uh, we just have to uh, 
grin and bear the fact that I'm putting out, uh, you know, 52 podcasts a year and 30 or, or at least 40 um, news releases a year. I don't see many other companies doing that. So it's not that uh, our base isn't informed. So uh, we we just want to keep in contact with our shareholders. Our shareholders are our lifeblood. Larry, for people new to American Manganese, what are you guys all about? American Manganese is a critical metals company, and uh, we initiated a, uh, a uh, patent on treating very low grades of manganese in uh, Arizona. Now, the U.S. and Canada does not have economic uh, deposits of manganese, which is critical. I mean, uh, you can't make steel without it, and uh, it's, so it's a super critical metal. And I just want to add that I see that uh, the next uh, year or two, this could become a dominant part of our uh, of our uh, focus. But in the meantime, that was the cornerstone of our uh, lithium ion battery recycling. And uh, you know, we've gotten stellar results. We've gotten uh, two patents that uh, that uh, you know was very timely for us. We recognized the opportunity early. And we got those patents. We got a third one coming. Uh, the company uh, trades on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol AMY. We trade on the U.S. under the symbol AYZF, and we trade in Frankfurt under the symbol 2AM. We have a very informative uh, website out there called AmericanManganeseInc.com, and you can contact the company by email. Uh, L Ray R L R E A U G H at A M Y M N dot com or phone the company at seven seven eight five seven four 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 four. Larry, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome, Jim. I've been speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on February twenty first. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.